Hello, my name is Anna Dolner. Today we will be discussing intussusception. After listening to this talk, you should be able to understand the clinical presentation of intussusception, identify risk factors for intussusception, and be able to explain how to diagnose and treat intussusception. We will discuss the epidemiology, pathophysiology, and clinical presentation of intussusception, as well as how to diagnose and treat it. We will also discuss the outcomes of patients with intussusception. Intussusception most commonly occurs in children between 6 and 36 months of age and is the most common cause of intestinal obstruction in this age group. It is rare before three months and after six years of age. A recent epidemiological study performed in Switzerland showed an incidence of 8, 31, and 26 cases per 100,000 individuals in the first, second, and third years of life, respectively. Intussusception is also more common in males. The typical presentation of intussusception is episodic, severe, crampy abdominal pain occurring at 15 to 20 minute intervals. During these periods of time, children often draw their legs up towards their abdomens. Vomiting may or may not be present. As it progresses, lethargy can develop. In rare cases, lethargy can be the only presenting symptom. Interestingly, the classic triad of abdominal pain, a sausage-shaped abdominal mass, and current jelly stool is only present in about 15% of children with intussusception. Intussusception involves the invagination of a proximal segment of bowel into a distal segment. The mesentery is carried along with the intussuscepted bowel loop thereby compromising blood flow to the affected bowel. It can lead to edema, lymphatic and venous congestion, ischemia, and ultimately perforation if not treated. Intussusception most commonly occurs near the ileocecal junction, leading to ileocolic intussusception. However, it can involve any segment of bowel. It is most commonly idiopathic among children aged 3 to 60 months, but outside of this age range, a pathological lead point or other primary gastroenterological disorder should be considered, as nearly two-thirds of children over age 5 have an identifiable pathological lead point. The most common pathological lead points include a Meckel's diverticulum, polyp, duplications, appendiceal stump, lymphoma, or parasitic infection. Other GI disorders that lead to intussusception to consider include henoch schonlein purpura, cystic fibrosis, hemolytic uremic syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, and celiac disease. There are multiple known and hypothesized risk factors for intussusception. In most idiopathic cases, hypertrophied Peyer's patches in the terminal ileum are thought to be the lead point. There is a known link to bacterial diarrheal illnesses and proposed links to various viral etiologies, adenovirus in particular. Other studies have shown that a significant minority of children about 25 to 30 percent have had a preceding viral gastroenteritis or a preceding viral illness. Ultrasound is the preferred method for diagnosing intussusception. In the hands of experienced pediatric radiologists, ultrasound is a 98 percent sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing intussusception. Another advantage is that it can be easily used to verify the successive reduction of the intussusception. The classic appearance of intussusception on ultrasound is a bullseye or coiled spring lesion. This represents multiple layers of bowel on top of one another. In addition, Doppler ultrasound can be used to identify reduced blood flow to the affected bowel loop. This is a classic example of an ultrasonographic image of intussusception. 
with multiple layers of a superimposed bowel loops visible. Other radiological methods can be used to diagnose intussusception. However, as previously mentioned, they are not generally preferred. Plain film imaging is less sensitive than ultrasound. However, it can identify pneumoperitoneum if the bowel has perforated. A target sign, or crescent sign, can also be visible. The target sign consists of two concentric radiolucent circles superimposed on the right kidney representing peritoneal fat surrounding and within the intussusception. The crescent sign is a soft tissue density, namely the intussuscepted bowel loop, projecting into the gas of the large bowel. CT scan can also be used to diagnose intussusception. However, it has several disadvantages, including radiation exposure and increased time until study results can be obtained. Additionally, it is not used to verify successful reduction. There are several non-surgical options for treating intussusception. Both involve the use of enemas. Patients should have IV fluid resuscitation and NG tube decompression before reduction via enema is attempted. The first technique is an air enema. Patients have a Foley catheter inserted into their rectum and either air or carbon dioxide is instilled through the catheter to reduce the intussusception via pneumatic pressure while intraluminal pressure is closely monitored. Carbon dioxide is generally preferred as there is a decreased risk of air embolus with the use of carbon dioxide as compared to air. Reflux of air into the terminal ileum is suggestive of reduction, but reduction can be confirmed by an ultrasound. The second technique is a hydrostatic enema. With this technique, either saline or contrast material is instilled through the Foley catheter rather than air until the intussusception is reduced. Success is monitored using ultrasonographic guidance if saline was instilled or fluoroscopic guidance if contrast was instilled. There is no clear evidence regarding the optimal agent for hydrostatic enema, but as sonographic guidance clears the child radiation exposure, the use of saline is generally preferred. Surgical reduction may be necessary for the treatment of intussusception and indications for this will be discussed on the following slide. Surgeons attempt manual reduction first, but if this is unsuccessful, resection of the affected bowel with primary anastomosis may be necessary. There are multiple indications for surgical reduction of intussusception. These include perforation, suspected necrosis, acute systemic illness, failure of non-operative treatment, or if the suspected lead point is a mass lesion. Surgical reduction is also indicated if the intussusception only involves the small bowel, as this type of intussusception is not amenable to reduction via enema. Patients who experience intussusception are at risk for recurrence after initial reduction. The risk of this varies based on the treatment that was used to reduce the intussusception. There is almost no risk of recurrence if the patient underwent surgical resection and anastomosis. The risk of recurrence is about 1% if the patient underwent manual surgical reduction. If the patient underwent non-operative management, the risk of recurrence is about 10%. As the risk is highest in the initial post-reduction period due to residual bowel edema, it is recommended that patients be observed for 12 to 24 hours after their intussusception is reduced. In summary, intussusception occurs most commonly among children aged 6 to 36 months. It presents with episodic abdominal pain. The classic triad of abdominal pain, a sausage-shaped abdominal mass, and current jelly stool is present in only a minority of patients. The cause of intussusception is most often idiopathic, although the risk of pathologic causes increases with age. The preferred diagnostic modality is ultrasound. Intussusception is generally treated with air or hydrostatic enema, 
but surgery may be required in certain cases. Thank you.